Welcome aspirants, welcome to the next lecture on nuclear physics. So in the last class, we studied about the liquid drop model, or you can call it as the semi-empirical formula. In this lecture, we are going to study one more model, but I'm not going to go in the detail of shell model. I want to tell you that shell model was a very big achievement for nuclear physics. It was able to explain the nuclear spins, that nucleus is born with some sort of spin, intrinsic spin. And it is a good time that we understand about the spin. So spin is basically the property which allows us, uh, which allows the nucleus to behave as if it has some sort of angular moment. Where do we see angular moment? Whenever our nucleus interact with the magnetic field, and that happens a lot. So whenever our nucleus interact with magnetic field, then the nucleus show its angular momentum properties because angular momentum behaves, angular momentum sort of gives magnetic moment. If you have angular momentum, you will have magnetic moment. And you must have seen the uh, magnetic properties of solid in that I have discussed about this in detail that if you have angular momentum, you will have magnetic moment. And if you have a magnetic moment, then if you place that magnetic moment in magnetic field, you can either have a stable position or unstable position. So that sort of physics start. Okay. So that is why we were seeing that nucleus is showing some sort of behavior when it is placed in the magnetic field. And that could only be explained that if, electro if nucleus itself is born with some sort of angular moment. But from where this angular momentum will come? So the angular momentum will basically come from its nucleons, from the protons and neutrons. Now protons and neutrons themselves are spin half particles. They have their own uh, angular momentum and as a result, they combine together to give some angular momentum to the uh, nucleus as well. Okay. That is why the nucleus has a net angular momentum and also net magnetic moment. Okay. Now, if we go in detail, then shell model basically helps us to find this angular momentum or this magnetic moment. And I will teach you how to find the angular momentum. I will teach you two things. And the gate exam is filled with these questions. Find the angular momentum, find the angular momentum, find the angular momentum. So many questions have came and all of them are very easy. So it is the easiest marks you can get from the examination. So let's see. Now I want to say that how to, how to find the angular momentum using the shell model. Okay. So shell model basically said that in a nucleus, there are different energy levels. And our nucleons are filling up these energy levels. How are these energy levels are inside the nucleus? So shell did some calculation. Shell model did some calculation. Shell basically means... In atom, atomic physics also, you know, shells, sh uh, sorry, subshells and all of that. Similar kind of idea was introduced in nucleus as well. And it is basically, uh, we are saying that nucleus also have some sort of shells or you can say different energy levels. And our nucleons are coming and filling up those new energy levels. Okay. Now, the very first situation is 1s. So, how are our new energy levels? Number 1 is 1s half. So, what is this S? What is this half? One is, you can ignore one. That basically means first shell that you can ignore. That is not our purpose. First is S. So S is basically telling you that in which shell you are in. Either you are in S shell, P shell, what shell. Half is telling you that what is your spin? Is it half spin, 3 by 2 spin, 5 by 2 spin? What is this? And this thing two, two is telling you that how many number of nucleons can be there in this shell. So number of nucleons is always equals to 2j plus 1. And this thing is j. Basically, this is j. You can call it as spin. So if j is half, then 2j plus 1 will become 2. It means in j half, you can have maximum 2 nucleons. After s half, you get p 3 by 2. In 3 by 2, you can clearly see p 2 into 3 by 2 plus 1, 4. So 4 nucleons can be there. Then comes P half. Again, two electrons because it two nucleons because it is again half. Then D5 by 2. In this, there will be 6. And then 2S half. It is half. So there will be two nucleons. 
and then d three by two. So since it is three by two, you will have four. Then f seven by two, which is basically eight. Eight nucleus can be there. So you have to remember this energy. There is no other way. You have to remember that first we will have s half. Then we will have p three by two. Then we will have p half. Then we will have d five by two. Then we will have s half. Then we will have d three by two, and then we will have f seven by two. You won't need more than this. There is the list keeps on going, but you won't need more than this, and you should remember this because the direct question will be asked in the exam. Okay, so basically these are this is how the energy levels are there, and we will fill our nucleons in these energy levels. Okay, and this tells that how many nucleons can be there in one energy level, or you can say one shell, and S P and D tells you that which shell is this. Okay, and this one by two, three by two, five by two tells that what is the spin? If the electron is inside this, sorry, if the nucleon is inside this, what will be the spin of your nucleus? Okay, good. If you have even even nucleus, let's say you have even number of protons, even number of neutrons, then without thinking, you can say that spin will be zero. Why? Because let's say do you have four protons. So now two protons will be spin up and two protons will be spin down. So the net will cancel each other. Similarly, you have four new neutrons. So two neutrons will have spin up and two neutrons will have spin down. So cancel. So that is what the purpose is. If you have an even number of neutrons, then you won't have any magnetic moment or any angular momentum because of neutrons. If you have even number of protons, you will not have any amount of angular momentum or magnetic moment from the uh, your protons. Okay. Now, if you have odd even or even odd. So then you don't have, so let's say there are n num odd number of protons, but even number of neutrons. So since neutrons are even, so they will not give any sort of angular moment. But since the protons are odd, so we have to look at the protons now. So now take the protons and start filling them in the energy levels. Let's say you have the seven protons. You fill two, then you start filling. Then you see the seventh proton because that proton will be unpaired. First six protons will be paired, but the seventh proton will be unpaired. And that proton, whatever is the spin of that proton, that will be your spin of the nucleus. Whatever is the parity of that nucleus, that will be the parity of that proton. That will be the parity of your nucleus. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. For example, let's take the magnesium. Now, magnesium is 12. And its atomic number is 25. So its number of protons you can clearly see is 12. So it has no spin. Because protons are even in number. So protons will not contribute to any spin. But the number of neutrons are 13. Which is odd. So it means the number of neutrons will contribute to the spin. Okay. Now let's start filling. First of all we will fill in 1 as half. So 2, new, two neutrons I filled. Then comes P3 by 2. So 4 I filled here. Then I comes P1 by 2, 2 I have filled here. Now then comes D5 by 2. I can fill 6 in this, but only 5 are left. Because 2 plus 4, 6 plus 2, 8. Now only 5 are left. So in this, 5 are filled. I can maximum fill up to 6. But only 5 are filled. So my last unpaired neutron is in D5 by 2. So my last unpaired neutron is in D5 by 2. So my spin of the nucleus will be 5 by 2. That's all. So the spin of my nucleus will be D5. Will be 5 by 2. That's all. That will be my spin. What about the parity? Do I have an even parity or odd parity? We, I'm not going in much detail about what is parity. Don't worry about it. Some, there is something known as parity. If I explain you in one line, that is basically that this basically tells you that if you reverse the coordinates does your wave function changes or remains same? If you reverse your coordinates, means you replace x with minus x, y with minus y. So if you do the mirror image of your coordinates, so the wave function of the particle, does it reverse? It becomes negative or do it remain same? If it remains same, then do you have an even parity? But if it changes, it reverses, then you have a negative. How do we calculate the parity? So parity can either take two values, either minus one or plus one. That's all. You cannot have any other value. So parity is defined as minus one raised to power L. Now what is L? Now L can be calculated as this. 
L is zero if you are in S shell. L is one if you are in P shell. L is two if you are in D shell, and S is L is three if you are in F shell. So I am in D shell, so my L will be two. So minus one raised to power two will be one. It means I have an even parity because I am not getting minus one; I am getting plus one, so I have an even parity. So uh, how do I represent my spin parity? So spin is five by two, and on the raised to power, I write plus. So you basically represent like this, J P. J is your spin and P is your parity. So I have five by two plus, this is my state of the nucleus. So my nucleus state is defined as five by two plus, which basically means the spin of the nucleus is five by two and the parity of the nucleus is positive or even, okay. Now there are some shell model assumptions. So how did the shell came up to these energy levels, which I showed you. So basically shell, shell model tried the different things. First, it tried spherical well potential. So it considered that there is a spherical well, okay? Because whenever you want to de when want to study nuclear studies, you want to study how your nucleus looks like. So you have to compare it with some quantum system, which is similar to that. So first of all, uh, Shell tried that. Let's assume that you we have we have a three D spherical well, okay? In that situation, what the what the thing is that potential is zero in this sphere, but potential is infinite outside this. But still, there were some problems in this. Then it assumed that you have a 3D harmonic oscillator, half k r square. But still, there were some problems. Then he said, then section wood model came up, which was basically the experimental potential. So we, we studied that, yes, our radius was also something like this. You remember our density was changing like this. So from that kind of experiments, he predicted that our potential should be something like this. You can see there, the similar kind of relation was there. For the rate, for the density as well, right? So he predicted that okay, might be the potential is of this kind of format. Okay, so all these things were done, and then in the end, there was one spin orbit potential as well, which was quite very close to explaining what is happening in reality. So these were the different models which Shell used, Shell model used to come to the conclusion that these are the energy levels which are present. We don't have to go in detail that how the calculations were being done or, but we have to remember that what are the energy levels, okay? Once you remember the energy levels, then you can easily solve the problem, which will be asked in the gate or you can call it as in the net also the similar kind of questions. Are. Now there are some achievements. So shell model was able to explain the spin, obviously, and it was able to explain for the, um, even even nuclear. It was even able to explain for odd even nuclear. But the problem was that it is not able to explain for odd odd nuclear. For some of them, it was able to explain, but not for all of them. Okay. It also explains the magic numbers. Okay. It explained the magnetic movement, quadrupole movement, all of those things. We will discuss that in next class, by the way. Then it fails in some things. And the failure was basically that it was not able to explain the spin values accurately for many nuclei. For some nuclei, it was not able to give the good calculations. Okay. It was, it, it was able to explain the ground state, but it was not able to explain the excited states of the nucleus. Okay. It was not able to explain some of the magnetic movements as well. Okay. So there were some problems with this. So although it was a good successful model, but still it could not explain the nuclear movements for all the nucleuses. Okay. So that was one of the big, bigger failure of this model. Okay. So let's do some of the problem. First problem I have actually already given you uh, magnesium problem. So you can clearly see that carbon 614. So you can clearly see if this is even even nucleus. Basically they have given you two nucleuses. One is carbon 614 and another is magnesium 1225. Now, carbon-614 is an even-even nuclear. It has six number of protons and eight number of neutrons. Even-even. So, the sp spin will be zero. But for the 12 magnesium-25, you already know the spin comes out to be 5 by 2. We just calculated that. So, that is half integer spin. So, your answer will be half integer 0 and half integer spin. 0 for this and for this, you have half integer spin. 
let's do another question so they are basically asking that what will be the spin and parity for 4 beryllium 9 now for 4 beryllium 9 there will be 4 protons and 5 neutrons now protons are even so we can we can ignore protons because because of protons there will be no spin but there will be spin because of neutrons and there are 5 neutrons so let's start filling so first orbital will be 1 as half so you have to put 2 neutrons there and second orbital will be 1 p 3 by 2. You can put 4, but you are only left with this 3. So in 1 p 3 by 2, you put 3 neutrons. So you can clearly see that your last neutron is in p 3 by 2. Basically, the value of j is 3 by 2. But the value of parity is minus 1 raised to power l. And for p, your l is 1, right? For p, your l is 1. So minus 1 raised to power 1 is minus 1. So in this case, your parity is odd. So how do you write your state? Spin raised to power minus. So 3 by 2 minus. So this will be your state. So your parity is 3 by 2 and parity is odd and your spin is 3 by 2. So your option number A is good. Okay. So now you can similarly use this model to find for oxygen. That you can do. I leave it up to you. That you can easily do. Okay. And for this question also, you try it. It is again, you have to find the spin and parity. You try it. Okay. Yeah. I want to discuss this question, which is very nice question. So they are giving you the three oxygen atoms. They are saying that three oxygen atoms are given. For oxygen 15, you have some binding energy. For oxygen 16, you have some binding energy. And for oxygen 17, you have some binding energy. Okay. They are basically saying that what will be the energy gap between 1p half and 1d 5 by 2. How do we calculate such questions? So for three different nucleuses, they are giving you the binding. And they are asking that what will be the energy gap, gap between the two energy levels? What are those energy levels? 1d half, 1p half and 1d 5 by 2. Okay. So first of all, I have to look inside and I have to see that how the protons and neutrons are arranged in the oxygen. So now number of protons in oxygen is 8. So you can ignore that because that's an even number. But in oxygen 15, you have 7 neutrons. So if I start filling the 7 neutrons, 2 of them will go in S half. 4 of them will go in S P 3 by 2. And the remaining one will go in P half. Okay. Then I do for oxygen 16. So everything will remain same. But the neutron number increased by 1. So now instead of 1 in P half. You will have 2 in P half. Okay. And then in oxygen 17. One more neutron is added. So up to here it will remain same. And then one next neutron will go to D5. Okay. So if I calculate the binding energy. If I want to calculate the energy of this state, energy of P half. So what I can do is I can minus, I can subtract the energy of this minus this. If I subtract the energy of oxygen 16 by oxygen 15, then I will get the energy of P half. Why? Because the only difference between 16 oxygen and 15 oxygen is one energy level, which is just P half. Right. You can clearly see. Both of them has S half. Both of them has P 3 by 2. This has only 1 P half and this has 2 P halves. So if I subtract these two, I will get the energy of 1 P half. For one nucleon in P half, what will be the energy? So that I can do. So if I subtract the binding energy of both, so I will get the energy of P half. So I subtracted the binding energy of both. If you do that, binding energies are given to you. You will get 15.66 megaliter. Okay. But if I subtract these two binding nets, this and this, I get the energy of D, D5 by 2. Right? You can clearly see. Both of them has S half. Both of them has P3 by 2. Both of them has P half. But this has D5 by 2, but this does not have D5 by 2. If I subtract the binding energy of both, I will get the energy of D5 by 2. So if I subtract both, I get the energy of D5 by 2. So this is my energy of P1 by 2 and this is my energy of D5 by 2. If I subtract both, I will get the energy difference between them. 
So if I subtract 15.6 is and 4.14, I get the energy difference between them, which is 11.52 megalect. So basically it is option number B. Okay. So I hope it is clear. Last question for today. And this is basically telling you that you remember I told you uh, that shall use the different, different kind of quantum systems to approximate the nucleus. So now he's saying that assume that nucleus is three dimensional cube. What will be the magic numbers? You can blame me that sir, you haven't told, taught anything like this. But I want to give you, develop an idea inside your head. How you can solve such kind of problems or how you can think. In an exam, he can ask you any such random questions, but you have to think. What is the energy levels for 3D box that you already know? That is nx square plus ny square plus nz square. h cut square by 2ma square. Now let's assume that h cut square by 2ma square is some constant which is e. I'm just assuming that so, that so that I don't have to write again. nx, ny and nz can take value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so on. So what is the minimum value of nx square plus ny square plus nz square? So the minimum value of n, this will be 3. And this value will be when nx, ny, and nz, all of them are 1, 1. If all of them are 1, 1, 1, this thing will become 3 and your energy level will become 3 E naught. So the first energy level, so for the first energy level, you will have the energy 3 E naught. And there is only one degeneracy. Means only one possibility is there which can give you energy 3 E naught. And that possibility is nx1, ny1, and nz. And in one energy level, you can have two nucleons. Spin up, spin down. Sorry, spin up, spin down. What about the second energy level? The next energy level will be when one of them will become two. Out of these three, one of them become two and other two remains one. So what will happen? You have three possibilities. Two, one, 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 two, one, 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 two. If you do that, nx square plus ny square plus nz square will become 6. And energy will become 6 e naught. And the degeneracy of this state, which state? 6 e naught state will be 3. Energy of this state will be 3. Because there are 3 possible possibilities. Degeneracy is 3. In 3 states, there can be 6 nucleons. Because in each state, there can be 2. So in 3, there will be 6. Then comes the next energy level. In this, what will happen? Two of them becomes two two, and one remains one. So two two one, two one two, one two two. So there are three possibilities, such possibilities. For this kind of situation, nx square plus ny square plus nz square becomes nine. So your energy becomes nine e naught. So there are three possibilities for which you can get nine i naught. So three possibility means three different levels and which basically means degeneracy three and it means you can have six nucleons here. So that much data is enough to conclude our point. So first state is filling two nucleons. Second state is filling six nucleons and third state is also filling six nucleons. So this is like first shell. This is like second shell and this is like third shell. Shell number one, shell number two, shell number three. When does magic number comes? So I told you in the, the in the class in the last lecture. Then what is wh what happens in, with magic numbers? So the very basic thing about magic numbers is that when the shells are fully filled, you get a magic because your binding energy increases so much. Because fully fully filled states are very stable states. So for fully filled shells, you get a very high stability and basically you get a magic numbers. Okay. So when will the first time be? shell will be filled. Shell will be filled when there is two nucleons. In that case, first shell will be filled. When will the second time be all the shells will be filled? It means the shells will be fully filled. That will happen at eight because if you have eight nucleons, you will have two in first shell and six in another shell. So both first two shells will be completely filled. So first time filling will happen at Two. Second time filling will not happen at 6. It will happen at 8. Because you need 8 nucleons. Because 2 of them will go in first shell and 6 of them will go in second shell. So it will be completely filled situation. 
then the next time the filling will happen complete filling will happen at 14 two in first shell six in second shell and six in third shell so total 14 so for 14 you will have again fully filled shells so what are your magic number your magic numbers are 2 8 14 and this kind of order is given in only one option which is basically 2 8 14 so your option number c is correct in this case. okay so this was about the shell mode i skipped a lot of data in this to be very frank i focused on the part which is required for your exam i have covered all the questions which i have asked so far in gate examination nothing is left but I did not went into the details of how Shell calculated all these things. I do not feel any requirement to do that. That is why I did not went into that. If that comes, it means the exam is very hard and you can skip that question. But otherwise, if you will look at the trend so far, these are the type of questions which are coming from the Shell. So this will give you a very quick idea of how to cover the Shell model. And I hope that you have done that. Okay. So that's all for today. I will, uh, in the next class, I will do two more models, which is basically a rotational model and Fermi gas model. And then I will end with the modeling part and then we will move to the radioactive. Okay. So that's all for today. I will see you in the next.